This video is sponsored by Third Wave Water. This is the Weber Workshops EG1. It's a $4,000 coffee grinder that I've been using almost exclusively for the past three to four months. In that time, I've really tried to put it through its paces. I've run dozens of different beans from light roast to medium roast, using it at home and for hosting local coffee nerds, I mean, meetups. In this video, I'm going to share my thoughts on this as a home grinder, the pros, cons, quirks, nitpicks, and of course, whether or not it's worth it. Now, before getting into the review, I think a little bit of context behind this grinder and company is helpful. For some background, the EG1 has, in my eyes, always been the coveted holy grail endgame of coffee grinders, the one to be the be-all end-all. This comes from a company called Weber Workshops, helmed by Douglas Weber, who is one of the original members of the Apple iPod product design team. So this thing has some incredibly big shoes to fill, especially with the way the brand carries itself, known for a high-end refined look, products to perform as well as they look, and a price tag that even Apple would certainly be proud of. But the Weber name has also come with some controversy. From claims of poor quality issues, not owning up to mistakes, shifting blame to others, and perhaps the biggest one of all, the drama sparked between Prometheus and Weber Workshops after a negative review of the Weber Key Grinder. However, since then, I have seen the company take strides in improving by hiring Andrew, formerly of the Flare Espresso team, who I've had the pleasure of meeting in person at the SEA Expo in Boston 2022. And if you want to see my first impressions and unboxing of this grinder, be sure to watch that video first that I'll leave linked in the description down below. So some background and context out of the way, let's get into the grinder by first talking about the build quality. Now for a grinder of this caliber, price point, and with the way it's marketed, I am expecting nothing short of perfection. I opted for the silver version here, which is about $400 cheaper than the black onyx colorway. And I have seen the comments and the reactions to the look of this grinder, and I know, the overall design looks like a number of different things, from a telescope, microscope, science lab equipment. It's definitely not something that's really designed to blend in with the rest of your kitchen equipment. The grinder comprises of this large angled shaft with the motor at the top, a middle section with a funnel for dosing, and the actual burr carrier portion with the locking ring, and also a heavy base containing the rest of the components. The back of the base is where you would plug the grinder in, and it is made to be used between 90 and up to 240 volt environments without the need for a separate transformer, which is nice. On my unit, the port on the back of the grinder was just unfortunately a little bit loose. The surface finish for the most part is very good. The anodized aluminum looks clean with no noticeable blemishes from a distance. Up close, however, you can start to see just a little bit of streaking, presumably as a result of the machining process to create these sort of oddly shaped components. Otherwise, there have been no visible defects on the anodized aluminum. The black base seems to have a different surface finish. I think it's either a dipped or spray finish with a more sort of matte texture to it. However, the surface finishing similarly has a little bit of streaking under very harsh lighting, but otherwise there are no other issues I've noticed. The finish of the other black material components here seem to be a more traditional black anodization color with a smooth surface finish. The laser etching is also incredibly clean and very easy to read. The base also features a middle shaft for a height adjustable platform that comes with an oak wood piece. There's also an optional portafilter holder if you want to shell out an additional 300 bucks. The dot matrix LED display is bright, clear, vibrant, and easy to read, and I think it's one of the best integrated displays as simple as it is on any coffee product. The black button has a smooth stepped click for adjusting the RPM and acts as a button itself for purging, fixing stalling, or ramping up to max RPM quickly. The silver button is one of those classic tactile push buttons that you might find across a plethora of products and works just fine. On the left and right sides of the grinder are small platforms, a good place to put accessories like the Moonraker if you've got one, or the paper filter holder. However, only the right side here is magnetic. The paper filter holder is also a separate accessory for yet another $100 but it serves as a good spot to put the blind shaker lid when it's not in use. And trust me, I definitely made the mistake of accidentally keeping the lid on the shaker before grinding. The dosing cup or blind shaker is made of aluminum with a great surface finish that I found to be even smoother than the actual grinder, even along the awkward curved areas. It also features a magnet for self-centering on the oak base. And speaking of magnets, that is truly one of the best parts of this grinder. The dosing funnel, the blind shaker, the burr holders, they're all magnetic and everything feels nice and snappy to use. Aesthetically, like mentioned before, the grinder definitely looks like lab equipment. It has this rugged, industrial, space-age sort of design to it, with the large, polished, exposed screws, and a unique shape. Definitely a stark contrast to grinders like the Eureka McDonald series, or something from Option O. I like the overall design with these large chamfers along the base, helping to add a subtle touch of softness to otherwise a very rugged shape. One thing to note is that this grinder is huge. I've gotten fairly used to it now that I've had it for a while, but I have to remember back to when I first got this grinder to really get a sense of scale for it. 
However, from the front, because of the angle design, it is deceivingly smaller than you'd think, which I actually think is a good thing from an aesthetic perspective. And so moving on to the workflow. This is a single dosing grinder, which means no hopper. You've got to pre-weigh your beans into a dosing cup, adjust your grind size with the ring, pour it into the funnel, adjust your RPM, and start the grinder. It sounds simple, right? Kind of. There are a few things to note while operating this grinder that you should be aware of. First, don't make the mistake of accidentally keeping the lid on the blind shaker. Trust me, I've made that mistake more than once. Second, you absolutely need to RDT for this grinder. At this price point, I think a built-in deionizer should have been a consideration, but it's not. It creates a pretty staticky, chaffy mess if you don't give your beans a spritz of water before using it. In fact, they include an RDT bottle for that purpose. And third, adjusting the grind size uses this really interesting ring that sits somewhat loosely at first and seems like a stepless adjustment, but it's actually a stepped adjustment because of these little pegs that you can see. These are adjustable in 5 micron increments. Knowing that fact makes it incredibly easy to dial in beans and swap from filter to espresso and back. You can move the ring up and down freely to any height to actually adjust the grind size. Then you also need to consider whether you're going to hot start or cold start the grinder. Weber encourages, and I personally also tend to hot start the grinder. That means ensuring that it's on and running before pouring the beans in, as opposed to a cold start where you pour your beans in first, then start the grinder. And that's primarily because this grinder stalls. And it stalls mostly at a lower RPM. Specifically, I've noticed that to occur around 700 RPM and under with lighter roasts, and at 600 and under, you definitely even need to slow feed your beans, as even pouring in too quickly during a hot start can still cause a little bit of stalling. Now, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, as I have read that this could be to protect the motor from burnout. It's easily fixable by pressing the black button, which first reverses the burrs, then ramps it up to the maximum RPM, which helps clear out any jams. And speaking of jams, there was one very odd occurrence in my time with this grinder at a coffee meetup when it kind of just momentarily died. The display stopped working and nothing was really functioning properly. But of course, the good old turned off and turned it back on again trick seemed to have resolved that issue after a couple minutes of it being off. It was a weird one-off occasion that I haven't been able to recreate since. Once your dose is ground through, there's a built-in knocker placed on the back that helps clear up the chute. And then the blind shaker. Let's talk about the blind shaker. This is a tool that has regained some recent popularity thanks to Lance Hedrick's extensive testing on WDT methods where the shaker ultimately reigns supreme, but it also has a few workflow quirks that you should be aware of. When you use the shaker, you have to be careful to ensure that the inner portion is sitting completely flat and stays flat to the bottom of the overall cup. If you accidentally knock it off to the side from the bottom or even from the top, it will cause a mess. The blind shaker sits perfectly on a 58mm portafilter, but unless your portafilter happens to be able to sit flat on its own, you'll want to remove the inner portion a little bit more carefully because you can accidentally knock off the whole cup altogether. Now at first this entire workflow seems a little bit awkward to get used to, but once you have gotten used to the workflow, it is fairly seamless and easy. However, making drinks back to back, let's say for a small crowd, can get a little bit annoying if you hear some guy in the corner just dinging this metal bell. As opposed to dinging it, you can optionally raise it up and twist or spin the actual inner piece to get all the grounds to fall through, and with some RDT, sometimes the grounds can stick to that inner portion. When brewing for other methods, the blind shaker is obviously very easy to simply open up over something like AB60 or another flat bottom brewer. It is a little bit tight on something like the Cafec Deep 27, but it does fit nicely over an AeroPress. The shaker also never gets completely clean without needing to go and give it a good brush. Some grounds can get stuck in it in the crevices of the cup lid and surface likely from static, but it's not really enough to make any functional difference in my opinion. Still, slightly annoying regardless. With regards to sound, the EG1 is definitely on the louder end. At higher RPMs, the sound is much higher pitched and a little bit painful to listen to, while at lower RPMs, it's a little deeper and more tolerable. In terms of speed, here's the difference between an 18 gram dose for espresso at the lowest versus the highest RPM. Cleaning and aligning the grinder is also made ridiculously simple. For the most part, it's a completely toolless disassembly unless you want to go through for a very deep clean for which the recommendation is really only once a year for home use. For daily cleaning, you can simply pull apart the magnetically held together burr carrier. 
At burst, it feels almost painful to yank out a metal component held together with magnets with risk of potentially hitting the other metal components and causing a scratch or a dent. But somehow, after 3-4 to four months, I've yet to damage or scratch anything here. I found it easiest to first pull off the rear half using the knocker as a lever to pull it down, followed by the front half. To clean, I used the included brush with the grinder to give everything a little sweep, and that's really all you need to do most of the time. Every few weeks, you can do a little bit of a deeper clean with a thin bristled brush, and annually, or sooner depending on who you are, you can go in for a deep clean and alignment. Using a hex key to undo these four bolts opens up the burr carrier entirely, and as you can see, these are blind burrs. No screws holding them in, just magnets. Aligning the burrs is an extremely easy and satisfying process that doesn't need the classic expo marker wipe method. You can sort of just use your hands to hold the burrs together and feel that there's a properly smooth transition between the two flat burrs. It works well and I've had no issues lining and I didn't find the need to run the grinder to a zero point. Just align it, run some tests to get within the correct range, and dial in from there. It's very simple and very impressive to use. Okay, so I've gone through the build quality, workflow, cleaning and alignment. Now let's talk about the performance of the EG1. First for espresso, then for filter. Now keep in mind, I have been running this grinder with the core burrs or the default offering. Weber does also offer the DB2 burrs, which are designed for pour over and filter. The core burrs here were designed to be a sort of one size fits all situation, excellent for both filter and espresso, and I'm happy to report that that is indeed true. And as much as I love this grinder, there is one thing that's going to improve your coffee even more than a good grinder, and that is with good water. I've been using third wave water for years now as my preferred water solution. Simply add a packet of any one of the different coffee profiles from light to medium to dark into a gallon of distilled water, and you've got water designed both for flavor and to ensure that your equipment is staying clean and optimized over time. You can use my link in the description down below and get 10% off when you sign up today. Once again, thanks to Third Wave Water for sponsoring this video. For espresso, I've never been a truly straight espresso shot drinker. I like my morning medium roast milk based drinks, and occasionally here and there I'll try a nicely dialed in light roast, but largely milk based drinks. With this grinder, I made attempts to more regularly enjoy straight espresso, and I'm glad I did. The EG1 of Core Burrs have given me some incredibly delicious shots of espresso. Nuanced flavors, a rich texture and sweetness pulled through from excellently roasted beans, and these burrs produce an excellent level of clarity, even more so than what I've experienced from larger burr sets like the DF83. Now I am curious if these being blind burrs without holes for screws is contributing to these even more pronounced flavor notes from this grinder versus something like the DF83. Even for milky drinks, I've realized how much more the distinctly chocolate versus nutty notes of even a medium roasted bean can shine with this grinder. And as much as I do love this grinder and burst it for espresso, I love it even more for filter brews. I've been using the Cafec Deep as my daily for the greater part of the last few months, and found that roughly 300 microns coarser than the espresso grind size has been the sweet spot. That means if my espresso is a 6, I can adjust it to a 9 quickly for a filter brew, and back to 6 for espresso. The filter brews I have been getting have been some of the best coffee I've ever brewed, period. Rich sweetness and texture, clarity that distinctly tells you that this is a fruity or floral tasting note, and a body that isn't too thin that's often found in huge flat burrs. Visually, the grind distribution looks really good, and obviously I can't say with absolute certainty, but there was way less noticeable fines making its way into the cup compared to grinders like the DF83 or even some of the Eureka Mignon line. The cups I have had have been very memorable, and what's even better is taking this grinder to local coffee meetups. Being able to grind through dozens of different beans with extremely minimal retention is fantastic. And honestly, even without too much dialing in of every single bean, the brews were really, really good. Get into the right range and you're going to have an excellent time with this grinder. Dial it in further with technique and temperature and you really can't ask for better. This grinder to me is really the endgame grinder I always wanted. It scratches that ever-present upgrade itis itch so well that truthfully I have not been interested in purchasing any new coffee gear in the last 3-4 to four months. But that ultimately begs the question, is it worth it? $4,000, that is an obscene amount of money to spend on a coffee grinder. And like all hobbies, there are several points of diminishing returns, working your way up to something like this behemoth. And the EG1 to me is right up at the end, achieving brews so vibrant and flavorful alongside a workflow and build that's the best I've ever seen on a coffee product, but with a price tag that's very hard to swallow. And after four years in the hobby of specialty coffee brewing at home, I think that this is certainly the best purchase I've ever made. Working my way up for more budget-focused grinders, having the opportunity to test conicals versus flat burrs of all different sizes, this grinder is the epitome of what I've hoped to achieve from brewing at home. But that doesn't mean I recommend you diving into the deep end and going and buying this grinder right away. I think you really need to appreciate what you're going to get from a grinder like this by having comparative experience. 
If I went straight into purchasing this grinder and someone told me that this is basically as good as it gets with minimal prior experience, it's going to be hard to truly appreciate what makes the grinder so good. It's like knowing that you have to know what's bad and what's mediocre to then appreciate what good and excellent coffee tastes like. My coffee experience two years ago would definitely not have been enough to really appreciate the kind of brews I've been getting from this grinder, but having about four to almost five years of experience now and experiencing all sorts of levels and styles of coffee and coffee equipment, I really feel like I can appreciate this grinder. And I get that this is made in likely small batches, not at scale by any means, and it's designed to be this upper luxury sort of item for the home barista. And so I get why it costs $4,000. Like all big purchases, if you have the opportunity to try it out from a friend, family, local coffee community, I very highly recommend it. If you've gone through many other home grinders and you are looking for your end game grinder that's in this price range, I don't think you're going to regret the purchase. And so that's going to be my take and experience with the Weber Workshop's EG1. Having used it as my primary espresso and filter grinder for the past 100 days, and this is going to be my primary grinder for practically everything moving forward. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, feel free to drop a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next one.